Good afternoon. Welcome to the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedoms webinar series called Systematic, Ongoing, Egregious, Assaults on International Religious Freedom. In today's webinar, we will be focusing on Egypt. My name is Nadine Mayenza, and I'm a commissioner that was appointed by President Trump this last, last May, so I'm now getting ready to start my second year. For those of you that aren't aware, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, which we call USERF, is an independent bipartisan advisory body created 20 years ago by the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. We call that act IRFA for short. Our mandate is to monitor religious freedom abroad and make policy recommendations to the president, the secretary of state and Congress. It is important to note that we use international standards as the yardstick. We reference article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that states, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. We advocate equally for all religions and for the universal right to believe or not to believe. We also produce an annual report on about 30 countries that we divide into two tiers. Tier one would be those countries we recommend that the State Department designate as a country of particular concern or a CPC for their systematic ongoing and egregious violations of religious freedom. We also have a tier two list of countries that we have determined have serious religious freedom violations that meet one or two, but not all three of the elements of that systematic ongoing egregious CPC test. Our work is led by nine commissioners appointed by the president and the Republican and Democratic leaders of the House and the Senate. We always joke that we're one of the best bipartisan, maybe only bipartisan working group together that we really do all together um, advocate for religious freedom with really out any partisan differences. We also have a full-time professional staff, including Kurt Worthmuller, who is joining us today. So Kurt is a policy um, analyst with a particular emphasis on religious freedom in Egypt, Iraq, and the Levant. Prior to joining USER, he was an associate professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the American University in Dubai. We are fortunate to have you, Kurt. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Manza. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, what I'd like to do, first of all, today is give a little bit of uh, overview, a little bit of background on uh, Egypt, United States relationship with Egypt, and uh, particularly looking at the question of religious freedom conditions uh, in the country. Uh, you know, first of all, it's important to note that the U.S. relationship with Egypt, of course, has a long history in, in, in various forms, but its closer partnership and strategic relationship with Egypt really goes back to the Camp David Accords in late, the late 1970s uh, between Egypt and Israel, and of course, presided over by the United States. Um, after that point, the United States began providing uh, substantial economic aid to Egypt, mostly in the form of what we refer to as FMF, or foreign military funding. And that's been a lot of money, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.3 billion US dollars on an annual basis, uh, second only to US uh, military support for the state of Israel, just up to the north, of course. Um, uh, today, we're, we're going to kind of step aside, not because it's not important, but simply for the sake of efficiency. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about Egypt's most recent uh, relationship um, with its own um, uh, political and, and social changes since the 2011 revolution, since President Sisi's rise to power in 2013, and some of the, the, the serious uh, human rights issues and other sorts of conditions that are very often in the news regarding Egypt. Um, primarily because we want to look today specifically at this question of religious freedom conditions. And so uh, the reality is, is that uh, USERF as an organization has had its eye on Egypt um, from very early on, um, from the very earliest years of USERF's uh, reporting, in fact, um, either as what we now call a tier one or used to be referred to as something like a watch list, uh, simply discussing uh, some of the issues in Egypt with concern or uh, every now and then, depending on conditions, it's made its way up to uh, tier one um, status. And a, a lot of this question centers around the Coptic Christian community of Egypt. Now, the Copts represent the, the single largest um, non-Muslim minority in the Middle East. Uh, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% of Egypt's population, depending on whose statistics you're, you're looking at at any given time. And for a country that is rapidly approaching, if not informally having already passed 100 million people, that's a very large community that we have um, to talk about. It's also important to note that when we talk about the Coptic Christian community, we're talking about a very ancient Christian tradition. This is not a recent transplant of 
you know, converts because of Western missionaries or, or anything like that. This is a community that uh, literally harkens back to the very first century of the Christian tradition. Uh, in fact, by Coptic tradition, it was St. Mark the Evangelist himself who brought uh, Christianity to the city of Alexandria in the year 49. Not 1949, not 1049, but 49. Um, so this is a very, uh, very ancient community with very deep roots in the Christian tradition itself and has been very formative. Many of the earliest and most influential Christian theologians came from Egypt. Uh, Christian monasticism first emerged and became popular in that area as well. But jumping uh, ahead to the, to the modern era, um, long since the seventh century Islamic conquests, um, after which uh, Coptic Christians gradually became the, the minority over the centuries. In the modern era, Copts have faced uh, a, a series of challenges within Egyptian society. Some of those challenges have taken the form of restrictions uh, placed on them by the Egyptian government um, uh, in terms of uh, building, renovating, sometimes simply fixing very simple things in, in churches. Uh, sometimes that's meant societal discrimination um, from some segments of the Sunni Muslim majority. Uh, and sometimes that uh, uh, those challenges have taken the form of outright hate speech or, or violence against them uh, for uh, communities such as um, radical Islamist groups, uh, sometimes outright terror organizations uh, like the Gemma Islamay in the 1990s, ISIS in our own time, and some other smaller homegrown groups. Uh, it's also important to note, uh, although they're much smaller, there are other religious communities that exist in the country. Um, there is a community of uh, Egyptian Shia Muslims, there are Baha'is, there are Jehovah's Witnesses, there are atheists, and there is a very small but uh, sadly quickly disappearing community of Egyptian Jews as well um, in the country. Well, what I'd like to do um, over the course of um, just this last couple of minutes that I, I have is, is make a few notes on the current state of affairs um, based on our annual report that we just issued a couple of weeks ago, as Commissioner Manza noted. Um, Egypt has, in one sense, been trending in a more positive direction. Um, we, we are happy with some of the changes in discourse that we've heard, and Commissioner Manza will discuss a few of those in, in just a minute. But it is important to note that there are some serious and systematic challenges that continue, particularly on the ground and particularly in some of the more um, rural areas uh, of the country, which we'll come back to uh, in a moment. Um, in terms of uh, the national leadership and discourse, it is important to note and give credit to the fact that uh, national leadership in Egypt over the course of the last couple of years has begun to pay a little bit more explicit attention to the concerns of the Coptic uh, Christian minority. Uh, President el-Sisi has uh, really taken to attending the Coptic Orthodox Mass for the last several years in a row, uh, re representing national leadership, and has overseen uh, the introduction of a church building law uh, that was passed in 2016, allowing a means for churches and church-related buildings to register for, for legal status. And um, uh, we, we have noticed uh, a, a real shift in discourse in those terms. But as I said before, there are some real practical challenges that remain on, on the ground in areas where, frankly, it's always been the most important, far from the centers of, of power in Cairo and, and elsewhere. Uh, mob violence against the Coptic community uh, remains a problem, uh, as does uh, legal impunity for those sorts of incidents. Um, those incidences are not limited to, but they are most notable in recent years in many a governorate, sort of plucked right in the center of, uh, of the Nile Valley as you look down the map of, of Egypt. Uh, the, the graphic that you have here in front of you is actually a, uh, a mapping out of attacks, mob attacks on, on Christian individuals, churches, and property that took place between April 2018 and April 2019. So this is a fairly, fairly recent survey. Um, meanwhile, implementation of that 2016 church building law has, yeah, she was that that. That. Um, has been what we call as a. How are you getting that? I just click on attendees. Do we get that? I don't know. I don't think I have anything special. Um, it's somewhere around the neighborhood of only 15%. Oh, I'm not seeing that either. Registration at the time um, have actually received approval up to present. And so this is a matter of concern for us. 
There are some other challenges as well and some other nuances that we'd like to discuss in that regard. Uh, but before doing so and looking at our recommendations, I'd like to turn it back over to Commissioner Manza, who would like to share some of her own observations and experience um, in visiting and working on Egypt as a reserve commissioner. Thanks so much, Kurt. That was so interesting. I even took some notes myself. Um, you know, I was I had the privilege of visiting Egypt twice in 2019. I was part of a delegation that joined President LCC on Christmas Eve at the opening of the largest cathedral in the Middle East, as well as one of the largest mosques um, that was just built in the new capital. It was encouraging to see the Grand Sheikh of Al Azhar, um, Ahmed El Tahib, speak before the opening of the cathedral and the Coptic Pope Tawadras the second speak before the opening of the mosque. Um, we know these are important moments that can have a real impact on the culture, it, consider, you know, in, in terms of religious tolerance, but we also know that it's gonna take some time. On Christmas, we were able to visit the Monastery of St. Peter, which is better known as the Cave Church in Garbage City. It is considered one of the largest church or the largest church in the Middle East, and it has about 70,000 visitors a week. We were able to see them hand out Christmas gifts to the children in the area. As Kurt mentioned, um, we have also had it. We had, um, other meetings when we were um, in Egypt, and one of them was with the Grand Sheikh of Al Azhar, where he agreed that all religions should have their own houses of worship. We specifically asked if the currently banned Baha'is and Jehovah Witnesses should also have their own churches, and he said yes. And in fact, when we were leaving his office, he said, asked us to make sure everything he said was on the record. So we felt like that was very encouraging one of our encouraging meetings. Another encouraging meeting we had there was with the Minister of Education, Tariq Shaki. He um, is, is an overseeing important um, reforms in education curriculum, including new textbooks on religion. So they're going every year, they're going through a different year of, of curriculum. And um, in order to make sure that there really is no bias or intolerance, they're having a, a, a Muslim committee and a Christian committee both take a look at the curriculum and make sure that it's okay. And we saw some of the curriculum for the younger children and it was really beautiful with the images of both faiths and, and really the encouraging of children to, to um, be tolerant of one another. We also met with many religious leaders and heard about their own experiences leading a congregation and even with practicing their own faith in Egypt. We also learned um, more about the church approval process and how the church building law of 2016 is actually working. Some we spoke at were supportive and others a little disappointed. One thing we consistently heard was that it, at the end of the day, culture needs to change in order for people to be more accepting of Christians. Um, they explained just that one extreme is sitting on um, an ant with an anti-Christian view, sitting on a church approval committee couldn't hold up churches for an entire area. It also was disheartening to hear about the difficulties in Upper Egypt and other more rural areas where religious tensions are high and violence against Christians and churches is, is common. This remains a real challenge that the Egyptian government has yet to address in any substantive way. The government also is struggling with overcoming insurgency in North Sinai based affiliate of ISIS. While attacks by ISIS and other domestic terror groups has decreased compared to previous years, they still pose a real danger. While we were in Cairo at the beginning of the year, a bomb planted at a Christian church killed a Muslim policeman working to defuse the bomb. There are plenty of heroes fighting hard against extremism in Egypt. Unfortunately, a government effort to combat Islamist violence and ideology has turned into a crackdown on all dissent or criticism of the government. So the situation at times can be very complicated. While it is clear that President El Sisi is seeking to move the culture towards religious tolerance, certain laws and government procedures continue to interfere with those goals. In our annual report, we make very specific recommendations that we believe could have a huge impact on Egypt going forward. We want Egypt to succeed. They used to be a tier one country, but most recently have been on our tier two list. We would love nothing more than to move them entirely from our reporting. We do believe that the specific recommendations we have made to the US government to either do or to address with Egypt could substantively move the country in a positive direction towards religious freedom. Kurt is now gonna go through some specific recommendations we have made for Egypt, but I, I wanna let you know, we are gonna do questions and answers after he is done with that portion. So if you would have a question you'd like to ask us, you'll see a chat box at the bottom of your screen. If you can click on there and put the questions in and then we'll start answering questions in a few minutes. Thank you, Kurt. Go ahead, Kurt. Thank you, Commissioner. I'd like to talk about our recommendations that we've made in our annual report in, in two discrete chunks. Uh, the first one are very direct recommendations of things, of actions that we'd like to see uh, the U.S. government uh, take um, in regards to its policy toward Egypt. 
The second chunk is um, uh, areas that we would like to see uh, US government officials continue to reiterate, to emphasize, and, and really urge uh, their Egyptian counterparts to pay attention to spe as specific as, as possible. So for that first section for direct actions that we'd like to see the US government take, uh, the first one is that we'd like to see um, US Congress require the Department of State to provide clear justification for the release of any foreign military funding that's been withheld for Egypt, uh, including public disclosure of its own assessment and certification of Egypt's progress toward improving human rights in general and religious freedom in particular. Uh, it's been a, a, a frequent course of action um, that uh, on an annual basis, as the United States reviews its military support for Egypt um, to take into consideration um, what the conditions are like on the ground, is the government treating its citizens with respect and, and, and dignity and, and, and so on. And when there are real concerns, theoretically that money should be withheld. Um, and very often the United States has either passed through that funding or has issued a security waiver that allows that funding to go through regardless of circumstances on the ground. We understand, of course, that there are a lot of considerations that go into those, but when the you know, US Department of State makes those calls uh, to, to pass that funding forward, we want to make sure that it's done in, in an open and transparent way and that its assessment and certification of those religious freedom conditions were clearly and explicitly part of that consideration process. The second US action that we uh, like to, to see our government take is for a portion of that um, annual aid um, through foreign military funding and economic support fund sources um, to go through programs likely through the United States Agency for International Development to help train and equip Egyptian security forces that are in charge of protecting places of worship and other holy sites belonging to religious minority communities. As Commissioner Manza noted, um, of, of course, Egyptian security forces are on the ground. Um, providing some protection for places, sometimes uh, imperfect, as we've seen with the bus attacks that took place over the last two years in, in a row. Um, but um, there have been Egyptian uh, police officers and military personnel who have lost their lives uh, protecting the country. And we, we understand and respect that. Uh, but we would like to see the United States government play a more um, active role in supporting programs that help them to more effectively, more directly and more efficiently uh, provide protection for those places of worship and other um, places where there are, there's perhaps gathering or concerns for religious minority communities. So the, the second batch of recommendations, as I noted, um, uh, I'd like to spend a few minutes noting some of these areas that really we'd like to see the U.S. government emphasize with Egyptian counterparts, um, areas that we think uh, would really make a difference in terms of religious freedom conditions on the ground. The first is, as I mentioned before, uh, the approval process for churches and church-related buildings that would like to register for legal status has been moving very slowly. The law was passed in 2016, and to date, uh, only a little over 15% of the churches that applied have um, actually received that approval. And so we would like to, to see the U.S. government really encourage um, their Egyptian counterparts to accelerate those approvals uh, under Law 80 of 2016. At the same time, we would really like to see the U.S. government urge the uh, Egyptian counterparts to enforce provisions of that very same law that demand that churches awaiting approval that have submitted registration documents um, are allowed to continue to operate. Um, there have been a number of cases in which churches that have submitted proper paperwork have been ordered closed very often by the police as a result of frankly, village bigotry um, and, and on occasion mob attacks. Uh, and finally, in relation to this, um, we'd like to encourage uh, the Egyptian government to really initiate a national discussion into viewing that law of 2016 as just the first stepping stone to a process of coming to agreement on a unified houses of worship law that covers all Egyptians, regardless of their faith, uh, Muslim, Christian, and otherwise, uh, a framework that would uh, really approach the question of freedom of worship as citizens, not as individual confessional groups. Furthermore, we would like to see the U.S. government really press um, the Egyptian government and its security services to immediately end the practice 
of ceding legal authority to what we refer to as customary reconciliation councils to resolve incidences of anti-Christian mob violence. Um, in, in nearly every one of the cases um, that we've seen over the course of, uh, of years and, and decades in which there are mob attacks on Christian individuals, churches, or properties, again, particularly in rural Egypt, uh, rather than hold those protesters or those who incite those protesters to violence accountable, um, what happens is the local community and in collaboration with Egyptian security forces and very often with the local government, they bring together a, a group of village elders, of religious leaders to have this reconciliation session. Now, a concept that sounds great, of course. It's a, it sounds like a very peaceful way to come to terms with issues. Uh, and it's a very long-standing tradition, of course. But what happens is universally, without exception, those who actually carried out the violence are freed of all legal responsibility, regardless of whether there was property damage or, or things like that. Instead, the victims are the ones that universally have to pay the price. And that can mean something like having a church or church building permanently closed, you know, theoretically temporarily closed, but it rarely reopens again. Or it can mean the eviction of a Coptic Christian or sometimes their family um, who are at the center of whatever rumor or controversy started that mob attack in the first place. Um, next to last, um, we would like to see the US government continue to encourage uh, their Egyptian counterparts to look toward repealing decrees that explicitly ban Baha'is, Jehovah's Witnesses, and other small, smaller religious groups. Uh, and in conjunction with that, to remove the explicit statement of religion from all official identity documents, and to pass laws that are consistent with Article 53 of the 2014 Constitution, which uh, relates to uh, ending all forms of discrimination in the country, and instead, we'd like to see the US, uh, sorry, the Egyptian government create an independent anti-discrimination body that includes Sunni, uh, sorry, non-Sunni Muslim representatives. In late 2018, the Egyptian government did theoretically create an anti-sectarian council to look into um, uh, issues around the country. However, um, that council included no representatives of non-Sunni Muslim communities. And in, instead, the, the vast weight of that council was placed in the hands of various uh, security-related agencies in the country, where sadly, all issues related to religious minorities have tended to rest. Uh, finally, last and certainly not least, uh, we would like uh, the US government to continue to urge the Egyptian government to repeal or revise Article 98F of the Penal Code, which criminalizes what's known as contempt of religion or blasphemy, and in the interim provide rule of law and due process for all of those individuals who have been charged under this law. Now, one of the major problems, as Yusuf has uh, talked about over the years, uh, in the Egyptian context and other places, is that while the idea that people should not insult other people's religion, again, uh, sounds fairly innocuous in concept, in practice, the reality is, is that it's very often wielded as a blunt instrument against non-Muslim minorities, against uh, Muslims who perhaps have ideas, individual beliefs uh, that might fall outside of the theological mainstream uh, in a given country uh, like Egypt. That's very often wielded against atheists as well, because simply to uh, express atheistic beliefs is considered offensive and insulting to religion under this code. And in the Egyptian context alone, there have been several cases over the last few years of about atheists who have been uh, jailed, harassed by security forces, and very often imprisoned because they publicly expressed in social media or elsewhere that they are um, atheists. Um, so at that point, um, I would uh, uh, like to, uh, as Commissioner Manza noted, uh, turn it over to some time for some question and answer at which we can um, see what questions you have. And, and one of the great opportunities of webinar like this is to be able to engage with all of you participants. Great, we are just seeing some come in um, and we really even haven't, haven't had a chance to even read them yet. So um, let me take, um, they're long too. <laughs> um, 
Yes, uh, we have a, a question here that I'd, I'd like to read through here. Is Yusuf concerned about or paying closer attention to ISIS threats uh, since the video that uh, was released in April from the ISIS um, so-called caliph, um, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, particularly his declaration of provinces in North Africa and elsewhere where we've seen an uptick in, in attacks? Uh, the short answer to that is, yes, we are very concerned about that. Um, ISIS, of course, has continued to not only show an intent uh, to carry out violence against Egyptian security forces and against uh, non-Muslim communities, um, or for that matter, Muslim communities that they don't like uh, in Egypt. Uh, of course, we saw a horrific uh, attack in, in 2017 against, um, against Sufi Muslims in North Sinai, uh, one of the absolute worst terrorist attacks to happen on Egyptian soil, and that was against fellow Muslims. Uh, but ISIS continues to show a willingness and intent to attack uh, non-Muslim communities in Egypt. Um, the most recent incident we have of that, of a successful attack, as far as the group is concerned, was in the fall of 2018, just several months ago, when uh, ISIS followers uh, attacked a bus of Christian pilgrims, uh, if I remember my statistics right, killing seven and wounding another seven in nearly the identical spot that another ISIS cell had carried out such an attack just the year prior. Uh, again, this was in the province of Minya uh, with a group that was leaving the monastery of St. Samuel, the, the confessor in that area. So we do have uh, some, not just threats, but real violence that ISIS has continued to show an intent and ability to carry out in Egypt. So that is a, a real concern. Thanks, Kurt. We have another question here. Um, regarding the issue of lo local law enforcement and reconciliation sessions that are biased against the victims here, usually Christian churches. How do you see the U.S. government and the Egyptian government and perhaps NGOs actually doing the training with local governments and having them be successful? In many countries, there is some support at the federal level for religious freedom, but local governments are more hostile, um, are often more hostile, like in Indonesia. What has been the U.S. government's experience with these local law enforcement and local government training? Would you have any insight on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can't speak to, in an explicit way, um, U.S. experience in other contexts uh, in terms of helping uh, at the community level make, make a difference in that regard. Um, and here I, I do want to acknowledge that there is a problem. This, of course, is one of the real structural long-term problems in dealing with these issues in, in Egypt because uh, Egypt looks very different when you're outside of what we refer to sometimes as the Cairo bubble than it does if you're going around tourist sites in, in the big city. And, and that difference, that very stark difference, really extends out to social, economic, and yes, religious freedom conditions around the country. Uh, the reality is, is that while national leadership uh, may have significantly changed its discourse in the way that it talks about religious minorities in the country, uh, the way that the president or the, the Sheikh of al to talk about tolerance, uh, talk about accepting and even helping protect uh, the sites belonging to Christians. The reality is, is that if you go out to, to rural villages uh, in Upper Egypt and in some cases in, in the Nile Delta region uh, between Cairo and Alexandria, uh, sometimes those local authorities are just as much of a problem as, you know, what we might think of as a faceless mob. Um, you know, the, the reality is, is that when those mob attacks happened, it's very often with local police, frankly, standing by and watching it happen, and only after most of the damage has been done, stepping in to put a cursory end to things. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, those reconciliation sessions, those are always universally done with the support and encouragement of local government officials, uh, sometimes as high as, as, the, as the governors. So this is a real challenge. And uh, I would argue that uh, looking into these sorts of programs where the United States can help support and even perhaps directly um, contribute to these efforts to train and, and protect and, and those sorts of things, that's one way of the central uh, government in, in Cairo demonstrating to these rural areas that this is important, that they want to take it seriously. And they're, they're encouraging and, and putting in place these programs to make it clear that they want to make sure that protection is in place in Suhag and Luxor and Minya, just as much as in Cairo or Alexandria. Right, we also have a follow-up question um, to that. Is there a better way to hold reconciliation councils in the future? And, and 
looking at that issue, um, it, to, it seems that the best way to go forward in dealing with crimes is using the judicial system, is for the United States to help train security forces, to help train judges, so that when, when people do attack um, a Christian or a religious minority or a church, there's actually a legal consequence for that. They get tried and go to jail. And, you know, even if the legal system isn't perfect, even just being, um, had be having them be tried and having to go through a trial is a deterrent to them uh, um, committing violence against religious minorities. So the problem right now is there is no consequence for, for their behavior. In fact, and sometimes they win, they attack a church, the re reconciliation session, um, that the, the concession will actually come from the victim as much as from them. And so really, I think using the judicial system is the answer to moving forward in these areas in Egypt to stop violence. And if, if I may add, Commissioner Manzo, you're absolutely right. I, I mean, the reality is, the, the irony of this is, is that uh, Egypt is not a, a new country. And I don't just mean in terms of its civilization. I mean, as a modern country, this is a country that has institutions. It has a very deeply rooted judicial system that's had a long tradition of independence in, in the country. And um, they know how to do law. Uh, the reality is, and so it's it's a sad irony that in these contexts, rule of law is simply thrown out the window. And rather than using that judi judiciary system that's in place, as you said, um, it's simply handed over to these councils because it's easy and convenient and, and uh, no accountability has to take place. And we understand they've been doing this for about 20 years. So it's for the thousands of years, this, this great country has is, is been operating. This is just the reconciliation um, councils have been a really short amount of time overall. So um, it, I, it really would make sense for them to go forward uh, doing away with those or focusing more on the, the judicial system. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, what is your opinion on the status of ex-Muslims and atheists in Egypt overall? Is there any movement at all uh, toward decriminalizing apostasy from Islam? Well, there, there's two parts of that question, of course. And the first is the status of ex-Muslims and atheists in Egypt. Now, when we talk about uh, those who are formerly uh, Muslim, there are, in, in a sense, a couple of different communities. One of those who have converted uh, to other specific religions, such as, as converts to Christianity. And there are those who have abandoned uh, faith altogether. And as uh, Commissioner Manns and myself have, have noted a, a few times today, uh, for Yusuf, we want to make it clear that when we talk about religious freedom, that's, uh, that's the freedom for people to believe what they want or not to believe if they, if they choose to do so. And uh, in the Egyptian context, as in other countries in the region and in other parts of the world, of, of course, uh, very often what we re refer to already today as the, the anti-blasphemy code, this is law 98F in the Egyptian context, is one that is very often used uh, to suppress those individuals who have uh, either uh, converted uh, to another religion, such as Christianity, or have abandoned faith altogether, abandoned belief altogether. Uh, because in that penal code, the idea of blasphemy is very broadly defined. Uh, it, in fact, it's, it's barely defined at all in that penal code. And so uh, for a judge or sometimes an individual who wants to bring a lawsuit against uh, an, an atheist or, or convert to another religion, which is allowed in, in the Egyptian legal system, um, uh, it can be considered blasphemous that they decided that Islam was not truth for them, uh, whether to go to another belief or, or, or none at all. And so blasphemy is applied in, in those cases. And so one of the ways that, um, you know, as we've said, we'd like to recommend that the US government really puts pressure on the Egyptians to reconsider this law the question of whether there's been any movement in that regard is a very hard one to assess. I mean, the sad reality is, is you know, we haven't seen a whole lot of uh, wiggle room so far, uh, willingness to address this particular code. But we remain hopeful uh, that as Egypt at least continues to change its discourse from, from the top down, in, in a sense, that it will at some point uh, be encouraged, uh, hopefully with uh, the, the encouragement of its partners like the United States, to reconsider um, the way that the blasphemy code is applied and included in its uh, deeply rich legal tradition. Thank you so much, Kurt, that's so interesting. Let's go to another question. Um, as you note in the USERF annual report, the Egyptian government told USERF that they would be unlikely 
Oops, just moved, sorry. There it is, to revoke the degree banning official recognition of the Baha'is. Did they provide an explanation for this? And did they express any openness to improving treatment of the Jehovah Witnesses or other smaller religious groups? Um, I'll go ahead and jump in and then Kurt, you can fill in the gaps. And so we did definitely have this discussion um, and we got some various responses from different people. Um, you know, they're, they're, the one thing that, that I heard a lot in Egypt that is very unusual <laughs> that I did not hear in places like Indonesia, frankly, which is the president's moving so fast. There are some people that were really worried about um, making a lot of changes at one time, and he's doing a lot of things economically. He's doing, um, you know, building the churches, some of the different things in there. So, so there's some different feelings on on how fast they they should move. We definitely felt that there were people I talked to that would like to see that happen, um, but the official government recognition is they would would just. Um, listen to us and, and say thank you for the recommendation. And, and so we really didn't, didn't get an official response in support, but there are certainly people in different levels of government that, that are looking forward to Egypt moving forward. And, and um, I think it would include a lot of these things. Thank you, Commissioner. I, and I, all I would add to that, because I think that's a very clear way of, of understanding that. All I would add to that is to say that uh, words do matter. And uh, I think it's significant that when the commission uh, met with uh, the Grand Sheikh of, of Al Azhar, um, in one sense, his words can be very general and vague with some of these questions and maybe say generally, yes, yeah, people should believe what, what they want. But in this case, uh, commissioners you know, looked him in the eye and said, are you including these very specific groups when you say that? And can we go on the record with you as having said that? Uh, now, whether that is actually going to be uh, translated into actual legislation uh, for freedom for those communities, uh, uh, or that's just considered his own personal opinion as a senior Sunni Muslim scholar, that's yet to be seen. But words do matter and they do make, make a difference, uh, particular for those constituents that look to the Sheikh Abdel as a, as a senior uh, uh, jurisprudent um, to, to look to for guidance. Um, great. We have another question, Kurt, that hopefully you can answer. Um, what can Egypt's government do to prevent abductions of Coptic women and the incidents of FGM on religious grounds in the country? Yeah, that's a very, very important question. Yes. Excellent ones. Uh, and again, uh, in, in two parts. Uh, in the first part, in terms of the abduction of, of Coptic women, this is uh, one of the most concerning and, and unfortunately one of the most difficult issues to pin down in terms of documentation because it's it's tied up with, with religious freedom, uh, and it's tied up with, uh, with uh, cultural mores, and um, particularly, again, in, in rural communities um, that, in a sense, live by a very different kind of lifestyle from what we see elsewhere. It's very difficult sometimes to disentangle these things. Um, and so there, there are a number of incidences that we, we follow on an annual basis where reports come out that a, um, very often a, a younger, perhaps a teenage uh, or young woman um, from a Coptic background has disappeared. Uh, and there are certainly, to be clear, there are certainly cases in which, let's say, a radical Islamist group has directly abducted her. Um, there are, unfortunately, other cases mixed in with those uh, accounts um, where there might have been some other background story going in there. Perhaps there might have been a relationship between this woman and a young Muslim man. Uh, and they've uh, looked for an opportunity to find a, a life together in a community that doesn't uh, encourage or allow really for those interreligious relationships to take place. But that's not at all to dismiss that very real concerns and very real abductions do happen. Um, and when we do find those and are able to document those, um, we do like to take them seriously. As far as the Egyptian government is concerned, they can take those things seriously. Um, this is, again, one of those areas like mob attacks, uh, frankly, where um, it's really up to the local security authorities to step in when they see things happening. And we thankfully have seen some, uh, some of these examples over the, the course of the last couple of years where Egyptian police have stepped in and made a difference. There was one reported such case just a few months ago. I'm sorry that I can't remember the names and specific location that this took place. Uh, but word very quickly spread that this young woman, a uh, teenage girl uh, in Upper Egypt had gone missing. And within a matter of a couple of days, it was in fact Egyptian police that had returned her to her family. Now, the, the circumstances surrounding her disappearance have, as far as I've been able to find, have not ever been publicized. But that was an example where when the police proactively got involved, 
they were able to make a difference. It's in those cases where the police simply step back and, and uh, for whatever reason of complacency or perhaps bigotry have let those things happen, that's when it's a problem. But when they do their job, it, it certainly helps. The second question, of course, um, uh, regarding FGM. This is a very, very important issue, of course, um, with uh, very deep roots in Egyptian society. Uh, in, in one sense, it's a pre-Islamic tradition and uh, very hotly debated uh, among Muslim um, scholars of jurisprudence as to whether this is A, any, has any sort of religious basis in Islam or B, whether there's, sort of, whether there's any sort of uh, allowance for it. Now, the vast majority of senior respected uh, Sunni Muslim scholars uh, and, and other Muslim scholars have come out to say, no, it's, it's not. This is not an Islamic practice. Those who say it is are simply looking for excuses um, to practice something that is inherently misogynistic. And uh, to its credit, uh, the Egyptian government really over the course of the past uh, 15 years or so, perhaps a little bit earlier, has uh, steadily moved in the direction of cracking down on this. Now, theoretically, and I apologize that I can't remember the precise year that uh, legislation was passed, but theoretically in the Egyptian uh, legal system, FGM is illegal. It's supposed to be banned at this point. And uh, again, we come back to that question of enforcement at the local level. And this is where the problems really take place. Uh, there had been a period of time uh, from the uh, mid 2000s, uh, really up, up until the time of the revolution in 2011, that FGM had been on the decline uh, in Egypt due to the government taking it more seriously uh, and, and looking for both political and social programs to put pressure on communities to stop practicing it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, evidence suggests that the practice has actually increased uh, marginally uh, over the course of the last eight years, which we're, we're very sad to hear. But uh, the US, uh, I'm sorry, the Egyptian government uh, is uh, theoretically opposed to it, but this is yet another area where um, the central government really should be putting more pressure on local authorities to more seriously enforce those laws that are banning it. Thanks so much, Kurt. That was um, really, really interesting and so helpful. We are so sorry we were not able to get to all of your questions, um, but we, we really appreciate all of you joining this webinar today. We're looking forward to providing more webinars in the future on different countries and topics. We also encourage you to reach out to your member of Congress and your senators and ask them to, to make religious freedom a priority. Kurt's email address is listed on the screen. Feel free to reach out to him directly if you'd like to um, pose one of your questions or you'd like more information. And um, we are just so thankful again that you joined us. Um, please go to usurp.gov um, and, and download our report. You can read more about Egypt there and about the different things we have going on here at USERF. Enjoy the rest of your day and thanks again for joining us.